We're going to be talking about uh, the book of James today, verses 19 to 27. Let's, let's read that out loud before we start. Verse 19, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, I lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save our souls. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one shall be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Thank you for your word, Lord. A little history of the book of James. I think sometimes we think James was written by Jesus' apostle, but it was actually written by Jesus' half-brother. James was actually one of the leaders in the early church of Jerusalem, along with uh, the apostle Peter. And James actually, according to historical facts, he didn't come to be a follower of Jesus until after the resurrection. I can imagine growing up with Jesus as one of your siblings. You know, he must have been a perfect child because he never sinned. I imagine he was always shown favor because, I mean, he was Jesus, the Messiah. I think uh, a little history about James is because when he was addressing the book of James, he was addressing the 12 churches, the 12 tribes of, of uh, the Lord spread out through Asia Minor and Jerusalem in Israel, and he was talking to Christians. Now James, the book of James is really a practical book because it tells us exactly how to walk with the Lord, how to grow in the Lord, you know, how to be a, a strong Christian, and what kind of a heart attitude we're supposed to have. And I think that's what the world is looking for today. A lot of young people, you know, they don't go to church because they don't see the reality of Jesus and how Jesus can really change someone's heart. And I think that's what the, today's youth are looking for is something real, something to hold on to, not just go to church and then go about your daily business, but something that can really change your heart and help society and make a difference in the world. I think when James was talking in, uh, in verse 19 about anger and wrath, it's something that we all wrestle with in our lives. I think anger and love and fear, those are all uh, types of emotions that we go through. You know, I think the Lord gave you all those emotions to use for good to love with all your heart, to love him, to love others, to fear evil, to do good. I think anger also can be a good thing when it's, and it's, it's, it's into the right, right realm. There's an ungodly anger and there's a righteous anger. I want to talk to you a little bit about the ungodly anger first. Paul, the Apostle Paul, tells us in Colossians to put away anger, but then he also says to the Ephesians, be angry and sin not. So which is it? 
Are we not supposed to be angry at all? Ungodly anger is actually a, a selfish, self-centered anger. We all experiencing it when somebody, even within our own families, someone um, questions something that you said. You know, and we think, how dare they question what I said? And the Lord just gave me a, an example yesterday. That when you teach on something like anger, the Lord always tests you. Connie and I were talking about washcloths, something that simple. <laughs> and I wanted to use the discarded washcloths for rags, but she thought I was going to use the good washcloths for rags. So she kind of jumped to conclusions, and then, of course, I was trying to tell her, no, I'm using the, the discarded ones for rags. And kind of got me angry in my heart, and I could feel it inside of me, thinking, you know, why doesn't she understand? I explained it to her. And that's how anger starts, is a little type of things in our hearts where we can be deceived and the enemy tries to get in there and, and twist it around and make it bigger than it really is, blow it out of proportion. You know, I'm sure all of our relationships with our family and friends I have had experiences like that. And when I noticed the anger in my heart, the first thing I did is go to God and I said, Lord, I need you to soften my heart. I said, it was just a mis miscommunication and I don't want to hold any anger in me. So I ask you, Lord, to forgive me for being angry and help, help to renew our relationship. And that's, that's how we have to handle anger something that it'll come up it comes up in everybody's life but we have to deal with it and we have to go to the lord the holy spirit and ask him to help us it, it sometimes in the bible it talks about anger being like a fire it said the tongue is a little thing but sometimes it can be like a fire you can give flowery speeches and be a, a good speaker but you can also use the tongue to pierce people's hearts and discourage them. Kind of like a, a tongue can be like a fire setting a forest ablaze. And it can get out of control. And that's the important thing about when we experience anger. It has to be contained and controlled. When you are burning in a fire pit, or you're cooking marshmallows or hot dogs over a campfire, you know, that fire is contained. But if that fire jumps into the forest or into the field, it can get out of control. And that's the way anger can be if we don't deal with it. The word of God says to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. I think that's probably why he gave us two ears and one mouth. You know, listen and be slow to anger and listen to what they're saying. Slow to speak. Be, don't be jumping on people quickly. Now, I before I was a Christian, I used to have a kind of a trigger that would snap like that. Ask Connie. Her and the kids know that sometimes little things would make me snap and I would blow up and be angry. But when I came to the Lord, my heart began to soften and that's why drawing close to the Lord and you know being prayerful and asking him to guide us it changes your heart so that you're not the same person you were but he says he gives you a new heart Those three things, uh, being quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, they should bring restoration and reconciliation to relationships that are strained because of the anger being displayed. Uh, I think George has taught courses on reconciliation and be reconciled to your brother and using scripture to 
teach others how to be reconciled. I want to give you an example of uh, being a doer of the word and how to hang, handle anger when it arises. Some of you may have heard this story, but I think it's appropriate for what we're talking about, about being a doer of the word and, and controlling anger because when I used to work at the paper mill, there was a man that was supposed to be training me to the next position higher on a, on a paper machine that I, a paper machine I worked on. Now this machine was like 100 yards long, produced a ton of paper about every 20 minutes. So it was important that we kept the paper going over the machine and making it. And there was a, a metal roll that the paper web went over as we were making paper. And this roll would turn as the paper went over it and it would produce a number. And the number determined how much bonus we would make. Now, some, sometimes you could make $60, $70 extra over your pay, over your hourly pay and bonus by how much you produced. Well, this man that was training me <coughs> was fudging the numbers on this machine because he wanted to make more money. So he was actually making that, that steel roll move when there was no paper no paper web over the machine at all. He would make that, that roll turn just so the numbers would go higher, and then he could write it down and claim, this is the bonus we made. And so they were making bonus, actually stealing money. Well, he asked me to do that while he was training me, and I said, no, I cannot do that. My conscience doesn't, can't allow that to happen. I said, I'm a Christian, and I believe that that would be stealing. Well, that offended him, and he became angry, like it says here. The word for anger in the Greek is orge. It means intense emotions. I guess you could say he had intense emotions over me, like crossing him because that's what he wanted me to do, and I didn't want to do it. So he would not train me. I was supposed to be training to move up to that next position for six weeks. Well, because he wouldn't train me, I had no one to, to tell me how to, how to do things on the machine. I had a manual to go by. But I went to the Lord, and I said, Lord, this man refuses to to train me and I'm trying to do the right thing according to your word, to be truthful and honest. So I'm asking you, Lord, to please help me to learn what I'm supposed to learn. And the Lord did, he helped me to learn and to grasp and to hold on to all these facts and figures in this manual. And for six weeks, the Lord taught me about the machine. And that the other man refused to, to talk to me about the machine so really, the Lord's the one that trained me, and I qualified, and I moved up in a new position. Well, this man, he was still not talking to me and very angry with me. And <clears throat> I went to a pastor at the time who was at a former church we went to. I went to him, and I said, what do I do, pastor, about this man that dislikes me because I done right? He says, there's a scripture here I want to read to you that he gave me. I lost it because I touched the wrong button. Okay. Then Luke chapter 6, verse 27 says, But I say unto you which hear, to love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, Bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. So he was, the pastor was telling me, you need to pray for this man and do good to him. Don't let him get to you, but stay close to the Lord and love him with the love of the Lord. So that's what I began to do. I began to bring them coffee in the morning 
began to tell him you know, he was a, a good worker and to always bless him with everything I said and did. And it wasn't long after that he was down, way down the other end of the machine, about 100 yards away, and he, he called up the other end where I was working on a, a phone, and he said, Ed, I'm having a heart attack. He said, I need help. The first thing I did is I ran to some other men, and I told them, you need to call 911. I said, because my friend is having a heart attack. Then I ran as fast as I could down the other end of the machine where he was and went in his office and he was laying on the floor holding his chest and saying, I can't hardly breathe. I need help. So it didn't take long and security was there with a defibrillator and all that and they had called the city rescue unit and <clears throat> before long, he got all the help he needed and he was taken to the hospital and he did not die, but he was changed in his attitude towards me when he came back to work after a few weeks. All of a sudden he was friendly to me because I, despite what he had done to me and how he acted with me, you know, I was showing him love and care and attention and I was being a doer of the word, like it says here in James. And that's important that we, we not just hear the word, but we do it. We put it into action, because we'll be tested. We'll be tested in our lives all the time. And unless you know the word, unless you stand upon the word and read the word, I think sometimes the Holy Spirit can be like a, I kind of use an example of NASCAR racing. These NASCAR race cars, they can go real fast, but there's restrictor plates on these cars, and they can't exceed the miles per hour above the restrictor plate. Now, they may be able to go 180, 190 miles an hour, <clears throat> but without the restrictor plate, they probably could go 220. Sometimes I think the Holy Spirit is kind of like a restrictor plate in our lives. He checks us when we get angry and he reminds us, you know, I'm here for you. I need you to come to me and ask me for help. And that's so important when we get, in, get angry because I've seen families, part of my family, there's been anger within the family over to my two nephews and they haven't spoke to each other or fellowship with each other in probably 15, 20 years because of something small and they held on to that anger and bitterness. And that happens in many, many families. The anger just builds and it gets bigger than it was. It could be like a forest fire and destroys everything in its path. But there's also another kind of anger that God talks about, and that's righteous anger. Well, that type of anger is okay because that anger is uh, according to what God feels, what God thinks, what God says. You remember when Jesus was in the temple and he overturned the money changers' tables because they were cheating people. That it was exchanging money from foreign foreigners that had come there for like Passover and stuff. And the money changers would cheat, charge more for the exchange. They were charging too much for like the buying of animals for sacrificing. So Jesus said, you are treating my temple which was meant for prayer, for turning it into a den of thieves. And he overturned the money changes table. And that's a righteous anger. Then again, <clears throat> in the wilderness, when the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness, and they, they made a golden calf as an image to worship because they didn't think 
Moses was coming down from the mountain. They were thinking back to their God, false gods in Egypt. Well, God had a righteous anger when he found out what they were doing. And he told Moses, i just like to wipe them out. In anger, I'd like to wipe them out, start over with you, a whole new generation. But Moses reminded him of the covenant he had with Abraham. <clears throat> so God reluctantly, I think God knew all along what Moses was going to say, but well, he changed his mind and did not wipe out all the Israelites, just those who participated in this ungodly act. It talks about, also in the book of James, about looking in a mirror, you know, seeing your image, then turning away and forgetting what you've seen. Well, I had a hard time understanding what he was talking about. But I think what he was trying to say is, the word of God is like a mirror. We look at it, if we look intently at it, we see that's true meaning and what it really can do in our heart. But if we just look at it and glance at it and walk away and forget it and don't be a doer, then we're not gaining anything. It's useless. Well, years ago, they didn't have glass mirrors like we have. They had metal that was highly polished but the reflection wasn't very good, so you had to look intently into it to see how your hair was and, you know, if you had a zit on your face. <laughs> but you had to look intently into it. I think that's what the Lord is trying to tell us. Look intently at the reflection of the word and see where you've been lacking. See where you need to be corrected we all need to grow. I sometimes, sometimes think as pastors and teachers that when we preach the word to the congregation, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's hard for people to receive. They want to change, but it's really difficult. They don't quite know how to change but when you begin to pray and study and look intently into the word and you see what God can do in your heart you know you you see like my experience dealing with that paper machine man that dislike me when you start to see the word is actually alive and can penetrate the heart of people and you see that the Lord can change people. I think we may all get offended by the word sometime. It's important that we don't let that distract us and keep us away from walking with God because we all need to be disciplined by the Lord. We all need to grow. We all need to be strong in our faith. I think the word of God can do that for us. And remember that faith without works is dead. In the very last verse, verse 27, it talks about the Christian who is pure and without fault from the father's point of view is the one who takes care of orphans, widows, the poor, the oppressed and the unloved, and one who remains true to the Lord not soiled and dirtied by his contacts with the world. So yes, we're supposed to go about doing good. We're supposed to help the poor, help the orphans, the widows, the unloved, people who are depressed, filled with anxiety, because the word of God has the answer to all that. They need to know the love of the Lord we are to be lights in the world. When you're a light, you want to be put high up above that people around you can see your light. I 
I know whenever we go to the store, or whenever we go out anywhere, ask the Lord to help you to be a light. Let's bow our head in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord, that we should be a doer, not a hearer only, that you can help us, Lord, to deal with anger in our heart, that you can forgive us, Lord, and you can transform our heart and soften it. We thank you, Lord, that you are the giver and the author of life. This is a manufacturer's handbook, Lord, the Bible, Lord, that you've created. Help us, Lord, to give us direction and guidance. Help us to learn, Lord, to be eager and hungry for your word. Lord, I pray for my fellow Christians that are here today, Lord. That they would all be doers of the word, Lord. Help them, Lord, to understand the word. Give them insight, wisdom. We love you so much, Lord, and we want to be more and more like you. Help us to die to ourselves daily, Lord. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.